Welcome back to the Developer Tribe podcast. Today we are at episode two of season two and I really can't thank everyone who's listened and reached out following episode one already enough. Knowing you and others have gained from listening in is a real thrill. This podcast delves into the process and practices of coaches, educators, developers and beyond, giving us their insights and cause to reflect. So once again, thanks for being here, however you got here. And with that, let's jump in. I like the microphone. It's very uh, high end. Uh, well, it... you look like you're about to do a band aid. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to hear that. I don't yeah. think anyone wants to hear that. All right, I'll uh, I'll jump in here. So my, my guest today is a former rugby professional and is a people and coach developer. His development work has seen him consult and deliver for Google, Great Britain Hockey, British Triathlon, the Rugby Football League, British Swimming, the English FA, the list goes on. He's a director and chief wizard over at the Magic Academy, a well-established podcast on season seven. I'm delighted to welcome Russell Earnshaw to the pod. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me, and 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 hoping to become chief wizard. So I'm working at it. It's it's a journey uh, towards. Yeah, it. seven seasons of podcasts is as as I'm, yeah as I'm sure you know is a it's a it's a big undertaking, but I'm probably same as you. It's like taught me loads. Like it's if I'm brutally honest, like it's it's just great CPD for me, quite frankly. Yeah, I found it an entirely selfish endeavor, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> what's, what's the journey been like with the Magic Academy then? And, and have you any favorite moments that you can speak about? Uh, yeah, no, look, and, and probably the origins are interesting because I worked for an NGB. So I worked at the RFU. And one of the things I noticed was that we'd often see people, you know, four or five times a year. And the, and the question was like, how do we just like share stuff become more connected over over time and so back in 20 what was it now 2013 that was well it wasn't like it is now quite frankly and and I always remember being a coach and being in car trips on my own and struggling to make sense of stuff and probably not having too many kind of critical or even friendly friends and so I set up like a sharing site called the Magic Academy we thought well we need to make it sound fun and so, yeah, probably within six months, we had about two and a half, three thousand people from all over the world. And it was pretty cool. Uh, and then I guess when uh, myself and Fletch uh, left the RFU, uh, we thought, well, we've already got a name. And I, I actually said to the RFU, look, you can you can keep this site that I've set up if you want. I mean, the, the reason it was so effective, and I'm sure it's the type of stuff we'll talk about also was, it wasn't an NGB, so it wasn't like there was Big Brother looking over you. It was quite informal. It was cross-sport. It was, you know, lots of curious people. I always said to people, look, if you're interested, drop me a line. I never gave people the information. I wanted them to reach to me. Uh, and so that's how it was set up. And we thought, well, when we when we left, we thought, oh, maybe we'll start a podcast and, you know, and uh, and it's like about 150 episodes now. And, and the podcast, if I'm honest, was, was twofold. It was one to, to develop myself and, and ourselves. And it was two to make it look like we had an idea what we were doing. So, you know, <laughs> oh, you should look at our podcast. Yeah. It's a bit like we're just completing, we're just finishing up our business website. And it almost feel like we, we need to point someone towards something. So, uh, that was the origins of it, and look, it, uh, as it's been a blast. I speak to a lot of people at the moment, as I'm sure you do. Um, the world we live in, you know, it's it's had a huge impact upon sport, and lots of people who are looking for jobs, and um, and and I guess that's been one of my kind of highlights, if I'm honest. I mean, it's the thing that gives me the biggest buzz is when Tom Hartley gets his job with UK Coaching and messages me, or when. Um, uh, Tom Hodgins, uh, I'm able to connect him up with some work for as a side guest day because I kind of get my thrill from helping people, really. Um, and the other highlight for me was, and this sounds weird, was the, almost the moment I got told I was about to be made redundant. So I just had the, like, relief and lift off my shoulders. And I remember 
I was in Bizarrely, and I happened to be in San Diego the next day. I was going away with my son and uh, take him on a, my coaching trips wherever I can and laid on the beach thinking, wow, like I feel really free today. Like, and I think I'd got, you know, the, the backstory is I'd probably got to the, I had a poor boss, <clears throat> uh, someone that definitely wasn't playing to my strengths, was making my life tough. And, um, and, I, and on a Sunday, I didn't look forward to going to work. And that's something I would never have said before because we are super fortunate to do what we do. And I thought, thank God someone else has made the decision for me because I think I've been procrastinating for about two years. Uh, like you say, it gave you that freedom perhaps to to, to challenge yourself another way. And, and uh, hopefully I'll get somewhere near the, the number of episodes you guys have. I, I gave up trying to count the number of episodes because you have a different number of episodes in each season if you go further back enough in the in the catalogue and that threw me off a bit I wouldn't necessarily say I'm the best with numbers anyway numbers was kind of your bag in your personal journey am I right you, you graduated from Cambridge University with an MA in maths and economics and then taught economics at Eastbourne College for a couple of years what what brought you over to the coaching world uh yeah it was interesting so uh uh, and, and probably, I know we were chatting about your uh, your brother and tutoring, and yeah. um, I just had this moment, and I tutor a lot of kids still, still tutor a lot of economics. I think I had this moment when I was about 17, and I, I just you, you just don't know what you're going to do with your life, quite frankly. And I went on an open day to Cambridge, and they said, look, you might, you know, you might be clever enough type of stuff. So I went along, and I went for a day, and I stayed for five days, and I had the time of my life, and I was like, uh, drinking non-alcoholic beer for five days. And, um, <laughs> and and at that point, I thought, this is really what I want to do. Like, this is like, and I just grafted real hard. I was good at maths. So I thought, well, look, I'll apply to get in on maths. I love the college. I love John's. And that was it. And to be fair, I then, maths was like, didn't see where it was going. So I changed to economics. But yeah, that was it really. I'm I'm really geeky. So my my son's 15, he thinks geeks are very, very uncool. My daughter's 10, she thinks they're cool. So I'm I'm cool to 50% of my family. <laughs> um, actually, 33% if you include my wife. And um, yeah, that was it really. And then I, I, I spent three months, so once again, I spent three months, one summer working in the city and thought, this is the last thing I want to do. Yeah. Um, I actually had a job as a teacher at Merchant Taylor's School in Northwood. Um, God knows how they offered me a job. And, um, and then I thought, oh, I'm just going to stay on for another year and played well and ended up playing rugby. And as is often the case, you know, someone gets sacked, you end up being a player coach. This stuff kind of starts to grow on you a little bit. Um, I'm sure lots of people can relate to that. Speak Also speak to a lot of people and I call it their, their midlife crisis. You know, they're, they're mid 40s, they're my age, they're they're counting how many years are left and they're thinking what gives me the most satisfaction and meaning in my life. And I guess I've just been addicted to, to the thrill of the ups, the downs, the helping people, the, you know, learning every day, getting better, the ouch moments. Um, I love it. I mean, it's, yeah, I just love wanting to get better at it, quite frankly. And, and all that led to, working with coaches uh, and as i mentioned in the intro you know with people in other institutions as well you and i met following a, a webinar with sports scotland to talk about the role of the coach developer and indeed the actual name of the role itself uh, in your time working with coaches how has your own practice evolved and do you think of yourself as a developer um <clears throat> yeah i mean it's a great question and uh, i'm not sure uh, what the answer is to your question so i'm gonna <laughs> going to buy time um, I think people do their own development so one of the things I would talk about as a coach is like I want people to open the door I don't want to break in around the back like they make those choices I think uh, my my role is often to give people opportunities or to disrupt their thinking or maybe think about something in a slightly different way or get them excited about it and it varies from person to person really no situations ever the same quite frankly and the, the beauty I guess of working across sports is that you can 
help people in other sports with stories from other sports as an example. Um, it's great when people don't feel threatened by you. So the reality is I'm not going to take over, you know, someone's football job, quite frankly. Um, and often people are quite fearful of that stuff. Um, so I think my job is is just to get people excited about learning and, you know, just help giving them opportunities. And that might be connecting with other people. That might be, look, Rusty, could you come and hang on the pitch with me? That might be, look, can we jump on a Zoom? Um, yeah, I think it's all of that stuff. Um, I get to do it in business as well. And it's, I'll just say, I just rang Fletch then. I've just jumped on a, so a business I work with, Tyler Grange, and we've completely changed how we do development. And it's now dream catching. And you're in charge of your own dreams. Um, you choose the two mentors you want to you want to have. So I just jumped on one with Becky and it was me and Charlotte. And like, why did you pick me and Charlotte? I'm really kind of interested in, what are your dreams and how can we help you? Like, that's a really amazing conversation, like that Becky is completely in charge of and we can do stuff and connect her and, you know, she wants to try out some new stuff and we, we can create, I mean, how cool is that? Um, so I see it like that. Now, I guess I'm also mindful that there are people that aren't like me. So, um, you know, there'll be some people that might want to put it into more boxes and package it. And that's something I've also got to be mindful of. And, you know, would want my other, one of my other biases is that really that, you know, you become accountable for your own learning, really. Like, I don't want to be the one holding you to account, but I've, sometimes we've got to find ways of, of making stuff sticky, especially at the start and create some success and some momentum. And then, of course, you know, I've got to, got to, Go and be that person sometimes as well. So look, I'm I don't know if I've answered your question, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's really varied. And I guess the as you would know, you know, the the more experiences you have, the more rusty. That was the worst session I've ever done. Moments where you have to look at yourself and think, yeah, when I made that decision, like, did I even have a second choice? Um, those those moments, as long as you see them as learning moments, have been like, yeah, I'm very thankful for those, really. Some really interesting points in all of that, and and I'll try and pick out the ones that um, selfishly I'm most interested in. It, one of those being, you spoke quite early on when we started recording here about with the Magic Academy, that there's a, a distance away from the environment that those people are working in that's why they felt more open to develop and work with you it sounds similar in the work that you were doing with the, the the business uh organization as well do you think that that distance away from the actual operation that the people are in is important to be able to help them develop yeah look um i mean something i even consider a lot is we ran uh, before I left uh, the RFU we ran a conference and it was across multiple locations so one team met at Google, one team met at Great Britain Hockey, one team met at the Brit School, one team met at Wembley uh, we then got together we we played a bit of touch together and we had a, an evening together and it was no badges like no one was allowed to wear a badge because I don't want there to be a hierarchy in the room of well this person's at Chelsea and this person's at, you know, at um, Marine. Uh, and so there's a, already this person's better. I mean, it's a, interesting, isn't it, when people talk about, like, elite coaches and Bob Muir say, what does elite mean? Like, they dress better uh, or, or just that they work with better athletes. I mean, does it mean they're an elite coach? So, so yeah, I mean, I think it's helpful that you're almost like uh, um, there's no badge, there's no hierarchy. Uh, the other thing I, you know, think a lot about is like of course like when people are in those environments they are experts but what can be their strength of we know lots about this can also be their weakness like they take care that you don't get too wedded into this river of thinking and you you miss this river alongside you that you've never even noticed before so you know and, and my kind of I guess one of my tactics would be like pretty quickly to go you know, so if I go into a football environment, I go, look, I just want you to 
everyone, you're not allowed to look at the football, like, and, and put your hand up as soon as you've looked at it, and it'll be 10 seconds, like, so can we agree that there's, like, some off-the-ball stuff that you might be missing? Um, and so, yeah, I just think that kind of being able to take people out of their river of thinking is 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 really helpful because, yeah, tradition is useful. Of course it is. And we'll have some traditions that, quite frankly, are, you know, so how many coaches have you seen practice half-time? Well, the reality is half-time is probably the time in a game you have the biggest amount of influence. So if you were serious about your craft and you knew that that moment had big impact, then you'd probably practice it and you'd get feedback and you'd video it. And and I've only seen one coach practice it. That's really interesting. And uh, in my work at the moment with one of the groups I'm, I'm coaching, we are aware that our time in concentration is quite short. You know, we're getting sort of 10, 15 minutes or so where we're really on it. And one of those times is just after half time is that we, we get we sort of get back into it, but it takes five minutes to hit that moment. And I guess much like you were describing with the development of people, and we'll come back to that. I tried to take myself out of the, out of the role of half time. So I would do a little bit in the first sort of couple of minutes after giving them a, a couple of minutes just to take a breather, they've just come off the field. But then I would send them into their own units to speak and then they would get together with the captain and have time to themselves. And I've certainly seen a, a f- fair few things on Twitter, uh, you know, some videos of uh, players leading their own uh, interventions. But then my reflection on it was, well, I've just thrown them in that. I haven't given them any chance to practice that as an intervention in training. So now it was about, well, when I'm doing small-sided games, scenario games, things like that, when we hit a half time, can I have them emulate what I'm then going to have asked them to do on the match? Yeah, I mean, you've got me thinking about lots of stuff already. So, I mean, one of the things that changed in my coaching over the last few years is heavily influenced by Amy Price's stuff around video game design, but like the players calling timeouts, the players calling pauses. But then, as you said, like, and then how do we upskill them? So really profound moment for me was at uh, Wellington Festival and there was a group of under 15s and there was these teenage boys having this huddle, which is fairly typical, like three or four lads aren't listening. Six people are speaking at the same time. You know, it's... Uh, and then uh, and one lad who'd been like really intensely listening kind of said, oh, hang on, just everyone, just, just take a step in. And so everyone came in really and he said, look what? What I think I've heard is this, that it's it's A and it's B, and we're probably going to see these two things in the next week. Is everyone cool with that? Yeah. Awesome. Like, that's 15-year-old lad. Like, all the coaches are like, what just happened now? <laughs> He's better than us. And, and I said, mate, what, sir? He said, oh, we practice it. Of course they practice it. It's not like something, he, he you know, he was born with. Um so I, um, and, and, and to your point, again, like, what options do we have now? We might not, not have that option, so we need to develop those skills. So we have options around half time, so we can pick the right one for the right moment. Because I think the reality is that not all our half times would always be the same. So you might go with this one, actually, I need to be really directive. You know what, that Perhaps emotion is the most important thing, and I probably need to get a bit of a reaction here. Or you might go, I'm not going in the changing room. That will shock them. Or you might go, look, are you, you know, grab a couple of players beforehand and go, look, are you, as we practiced in training, are you too cool with, with leading the half time? And I'll just wrap up at the end. And, you know, or you might tell those two players a week in advance, you're, that's your skill as a coach. I mean, that's, but in order to make good decisions, we need options. So if we're not creating multiple options for half times, then we're probably going to miss opportunities to, to have some more effective half times. Yeah, there's a, there's a wider balance there between routine and novelty. And it's something I noticed in my own coaching, and then I've used, used that as part of coach development with people. You know, what things are kind of non-negotiable, they happen every single time. Why is it that those are routines or those rituals are important? 
And at what points do you do something that's a little novel? So you said there about, you know, maybe not going in at halftime and what reaction that might get from the players. And clearly, it's a bit of a, a risk, but how, how do we get coaches to, to understand why they're doing certain things often, routinely, and what else they might do that's just a little bit different and, and not get stuck in either one? Yeah, look, and I, I think context is king. And I heard someone talk the other day, and I like, you know, and he just said, "Look, I'm not going to tell a coach what's right or wrong. Like, they're the king of their own context. They know more information about it than I do. So, and that would definitely be the case for me. Uh, I, I mean, if it goes wrong, call it an experiment. Is my advice. Um, but we've, you know, where does failure exist? Where do we grow? Where do we grow five percent every day, every week, whatever it might be? We've got to try some new stuff and get some information, some evidence. And then, you know, we might go away. We might read some papers or some books or listen to some podcasts and go like, this would make sense. And, and it's really helpful if you've got, you know, that's where people like, I guess you or me or come in is just someone to help them make sense of some stuff like what, you know, either before, during or after really. Um, and, and, and it happens at the top level. So I've been doing a bit of work with Eddie and England coaches and, the week before France said he significantly changed quite a bit of stuff in the week. And he just said, look, my, my sense is that we've done X number of weeks. And actually I think this would be helpful if we did this. What do people think about it type stuff? And yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's good coaching. And, you know, you, you then of course reflect upon it and see how it worked. And then you might iterate and go, we got that in the bag next time we notice this stuff again. So I think the best coaches are, you know, they're, 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 they're experimenting, they're noticing, uh, and they're, they're probably responding. Um, and they've, you know, they're seeing what other rivers are available. Yeah, I love the, love the river analogy. You've used that a few times. And as you said, you know, context is king there. It's, it's, you spoke earlier about dream catching with the people you're working with. It sounds more of an appreciative inquiry rather than catching people out, obviously catching them in practice, but also giving them that opportunity to dream big. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that process and what your role in it is? Yeah, we basically just uh, looked at and uh, we looked at the process as it currently existed and said, is this impactful? And how could we make it more impactful? And so the people, a small group of people in the organization and, 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 and we just got talking about dreams and then dream catching and that became the name of it. And then we look, what, what are we looking for? Like we want people to be in charge of their own development, to feel like it's their dream, to feel like, that they have control of it, that it's meaningful to them. So the call I was on today was like, so Becky picked me, me and Charlotte. I asked her why she picked us. And then, and then Charlotte just said like, well, you know, what would be really helpful in the next like hour? What's what do you need from us? Where do you want to get to? And like, she's just like everything comes out of her mouth. It's like, you know, um, it was amazing. I actually, I, it was like a really just God, you know, like we don't ask that question. We don't find out all this stuff that's in her head. And about ten minutes in, I was, at one point she said, "Like, ah, I see myself working for TG for the rest of my life. Like, I love this place." I was just like. They would be so lucky to have you for the rest of your life. <laughs> like, you are killing this. Mm -hmm. This is like blowing my mind. Um, yeah, we often, you know, I, I, I would speak to lots of people, both coaches and players in lots of environments who don't have that voice. And that's like, the coach doesn't listen to me. Uh, there's no choice in our environment. I have to, I'm sitting in the car outside too stressed to go in because I know that people don't care what I think or I am going to get bullied or like, that's heartbreaking for me really if I'm honest like and, and and sport of all things where it was our dream so we were all you know when I was you know 12 years old I was definitely going to play football for England like 100% like um, and I didn't but, but, but rugby was a, a close second. <laughs> and, uh, and you think it's, and, and then you're like, oh, it's not quite 
as it seems, but it could be. So there are some environments and you probably got a better insight than me on football. I, I, I see, you know, I would look at like a Liverpool, perhaps that's a, an exciting place to be in rugby. It might be the Crusaders, I think. Lee Blackett's doing an unbelievable job at Wasps where you can see players are able to be themselves. Um, I think Lee said to me the other week, like, we just want people to come here and get better. Like, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Like, that's coaches and players. So, um, yeah, I'd sign up for that. Be pretty keen for that. And I guess that's where we are with TG. We want people and, you know, if people go on and, you know, work elsewhere, then awesome. Like, brilliant that we've been part of it. But we want to help them fulfil their dreams. Yeah, yeah, I love the <clears throat> I love the sentiment, and it sounds like you have a flexibility within your role then to not only the context of the individual, but the context of where they work, who they're working for. How how conscious in that process are you of the culture they're in, the space they're working in, and then your position in it? When, when you walk into that context, does that change the manner of what you do significantly or is there just some manipulation to the framework? Uh, yeah, it would definitely be, I mean, look, I'm really mindful of it. You just made me think of, like, I think my spotlight profile says something like one of my take cares is can, can basically come in, wreak havoc and leave. <laughs> uh, can't remember exactly what it was. Um, yeah, of course I am. Like, I mean, what's helpful is now I generally work with people that come to me. So the door's pretty open and it's often the boss who's he or she or the gatekeeper. And so that's really helpful. So the work with TG, the work with Abbott, especially like the two bosses are like all over helping people get better. Like that's a reasonable start point for a boss but then I'm I'm definitely curious about like what came before so I think from a individual and an organizational level so like individually what's the stuff that's influenced you what's the the highs and the lows that have got you to this point and explain the stuff that we see in front of us now but the same from a business point of view so how about in 2015 some you know stuff didn't go well and actually that was a significant moment for the business and realized that they needed to do some stuff differently so and often in that position people are, are more open to change so yeah i would be really curious with coaches and you know what one thing would help me kind of coach you or understand you better um I'd, some of the stuff with um and he won't mind me saying this because um because it's it's in his autobiography but uh, i asked john mitchell in england like tell me about the kind of two or three moments that um, that kind of help explain why you coach like you do today. And uh, he said, um, two people broke into my house, um, tied me up and stabbed me and left me for dead. So probably realised there was more to life than uh, oh what I thought there was. And oh so gosh. that's a pretty powerful moment. And that would explain lots of, and, and I think, you know, he's a, he's an amazing guy, as Mitch. And, you know, I just think that's helpful information for me now. I, now, as the same it is with any person, what's the stuff that ex explains the behaviour? Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely and you know I'm giving big shout outs at the moment to Owen Eastwood. Is his Finding Mastery podcast with Michael Gervais is is stunning. I think um, identity is something that lots of organisations and clubs and teams have don't have or they've forgotten or they they did it at the start of the season and put it on a piece of paper and no one quite quite remember where they put that piece of paper um so yeah i think that stuff is is vital and it's the uh, certainly at the top end like if you look at what extra have done over the years in in, in in english rugby like their identity what they stand for the type of person they recruit as a result of um, how that's then tied into what we see on the pitch and how they play would be stronger than anything in any other club. And it's no surprise to me that that um, connects people up. It brings 
emotion to the party when you need it. Um, yeah, I mean, all, all of that stuff is fascinating. And I guess as we talk, you then, I then start to wonder like how many more uh, layers of wallpaper do I still need to peel back because of stuff I just haven't got a clue about. Um, and, and, you know, I'm really lucky as I'm sure you are, like I speak to people like Owen every every month or so, and as people like Aaron Walsh over in in New Zealand and people over here, and just really lucky to have people that stretch and challenge me as well and make me go, oh, geez, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, well, thank you for giving you know, all those wonderful examples. And what was coming up for me in, in that was that potentially the role of the coach developer or at least part of the role is is not to create these disjunctures necessarily in coaches but to help them unpack the ones that they've had so in the example a painful example you gave there as a coach developer maybe it's we're supporting how they view how they unpack that experience and take that over into their coaching take that over into their process um I, I sort of feel like uh, when i when i started as a coach educator i maybe felt that it was my job to create the disjunctures to really hammer home points and that um as a result of that i'm exercising the power of, of standing in the right kit and at the front of the class and oh, yeah, i have i've really hammered that point home there's a time and place for that perhaps but my my work within the parts where I was delivering content, that was what I was always aiming for. And I don't think that would be the same now. What, what, yeah, I, what... Mean, I wouldn't be wearing the, wrong, the, the right kit. I'd definitely be wearing the wrong kit. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I would be very mindful of what I wear. Like, I don't want, you know, people to, I want people to feel like they can be themselves. I don't want them to feel like, Big Brother's watching. The stuff I was thinking about there, as you said, that is. Now, sometimes it is to create disjuncture, but often, you know, lots of our stuff, uh, the powerful stuff, there's some of the stuff we did with Abbott, like, was just feel like I can be myself again. Like, it's almost like a sense of relief from people that they can be themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, wow. Uh, and, I, and I guess another, I guess, Thing that I often think about is look, this stuff's just much more powerful when people realize it for themselves. They don't want Rusty ramming it down their throat or hammering it in all the time. Uh, and I guess the other thing I was just thinking about then, and um, I had a call with Eddie the other day, and he asked me, like, what do you think makes you unique? And I think that's something we all need to consider, like, as coaches or people or leaders or whatever, is actually what's the what, what's authentic me and, and, and what's it that makes us unique? And um, and, and one of the, the three things are things that I, uh, that I think that I would always be trying to get better at. So one was like understanding quite a broad range of stuff. So I'm always curious about other sports, about business, about identity, about like anything really. Um, the second one was like being able to connect with people. So like this, this role is just different every day. Like you, humans are by their very nature different to one another. So um, the ability to go and connect with different people. So I think it helps me that I'm Northern um, because I've got half the country covered. Um, and because I went to Cambridge, it changed my accent so I can pretend I'm not that Northern to the other half. Um, I'm from working class background. So, uh, but then I went to Cambridge. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I did maths at Cambridge, but I can also be like, I can put the wrong petrol in my car. Um, so just that ability to, to be able to connect and share stories with people that, that you know, builds trust is, is really important. And the third thing he spoke about was like, just being willing to break the rules. And I do think I'm more effective now I'm not part of an NGB. And I, and I, and I do like, it's ironic that, the NGB that may be redundant is currently employing me to, to work with their coaches. But I think I'm more effective and I just don't think I would have had that effect because even me, I think I would have been going, you know, what if this goes wrong? What if like, 
I really upset some people. And then, you know, so um, quite like breaking the rules. Yeah, I, I have a I have a term for that part of, of my own practice, both in coaching and coach developing. I troublemaking. Yeah, uh, that's I, my that's my latest word that I almost said, but I'd rather you say it because <laughs> you've got much more of a troublemaking face than me. Okay, that's good to know. It's you look authentic. More you look more it's, it's all it's authentic to me then. Yeah, and exactly right. It is that sort of mischievous, slightly tongue in cheek. It's disruptive without being disrupting. Yeah, with good intention. Right, right. Um, wonderful. Rusty, thank you so much. You've offered us way more to unpack than I could have done listening to you first time. So I will be listening back to this several times. Uh, I do just have you know a couple more questions for you. Uh, if you could have an audience with just one person, who would that be? Oh man, what a question! Um, I tell you who I'm. Uh, who I'm. So my wife would say Steve that I would pick Stephen Fry. So I'm not going to pick him. <laughs> I tell you who I. I tell you who I. Oh man! And I, so there's two people. I love Louis Theroux, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but um, I would just want to spend an evening with Bob Mortimer. Bob Mortimer. I think he's a genius. I think he's like. Like he, he's he's hilarious, but he's really heartfelt, and I just love how he. You know, just I just did a podcast recently with a comedian around like how they practice and how they use language, and I think he's a I think he's a genius. It's an interesting choice, and I I think it it speaks to both yourself and then the Magic Academy, and and what I'm trying to do here, where there is so much to learn from other industries other professions that we can draw into what we do um, well, no other very few professions get the feedback that a comedian gets when the set is going wrong so when you're dying on stage and and how do you practice and how do you hone your craft and how do you adapt and what if someone heckles and so there's just this whole i mean it's the same as a coach really it's like mm. but there's but there's some now, when we did the podcast, I was like, oh, I'm like saying that I can only imagine myself at the moment I'm, I'm playing Wembley as a comedian and it's really quiet and now they're booing me. Like, what do I do? Like, and, and that's the times by about a, a hundred, the feeling when you're coaching and this isn't working. I've got this wrong. There's some kids or parents or other people watching. Like I got to hold this together, and I loved what uh, what we chatted about. And he he called it like he said, "You've got to be Donald Trump in that moment." Which, by the way, I wouldn't endorse ever being Donald <laughs> Trump. But uh, but Barry said, "Like look at Donald Trump when everything's going wrong, he looks like it's fine." He said, "The worst thing you can do is like they realize it's bad, and now they can see that you've realized it's bad." So you've got to be Donald Trump in that moment. So, oh, well, what a great, uh, what a great message from comedians to coaches. Yeah, no, well, thank you for sharing that, and I'll put a link to to, to that particular episode as well, uh, so that people can go and go and have a look. Thank you again for your time. If anyone did want to reach out, what would be the best way for them to do it? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Probably is my main kind of thing. So, at Russell Earnshaw, or I'm sure they can reach me via you tim if they if they fancy a bit of a struggle to get my details no oh, absolutely just leaves me to say welcome to the tribe no oh, mate thanks i appreciate it and keep up the great work and we'll catch up soon that is it for episode two of season two and i hope you enjoyed that as much as i did i gained so much in the process of recording and editing this one my thanks to rusty and as said in the pod his contact details are in the description should you want to reach out the music you are listening to is by BB Phoenix. Her online discography and further details are in the links. We're getting closer to posting our website soon and as soon as those details are available, I look forward to getting them out to you. As ever, thank you for taking the time to listen. Please do post comments or reach out. It's always interesting to me and the guests to extend the conversation and find out what it meant to you. 
I hope this finds you well, and we look forward to seeing you back here again next week.